Good evening. As you just learned, my name is Ellen Ketterson, and I'm a professor in the biology department here at Indiana University. And I study birds. So I study bird evolution, and I study bird ecology, and I study bird behavior. And I'm passionate about birds. I really love them for their beauty, for the marvelous things they can do, and I'm worried for them. And so I'd like to tell you a little about what they can do and perhaps recruit you to some of my worry and some of what I think we can do about it. A shorebird hatched in the Arctic will, just a few weeks later, throw caution to the winds and fly 2,000 miles nonstop to a place it's never been. Talk about uncharted waters. Birds that talk like parrots know what the words mean when they say them. So some parrots know as many as 100 words and can name 35 objects. Some birds can solve problems using insight. They can make tools and use those tools to make another tool and then look at an apparatus and figure out how to get that morsel of food they really want. And birds are a lot like us. They uh, form pairs and they raise offspring together. And some of them are faithful and some of them cheat. So some of these worries that are facing birds or worries that are facing me because I'm concerned about birds are climate change, habitat loss, cats, I have cats. Cats are a problem. Skyscrapers, things that we build, anthropomorphic uh, creations. So I've decided that I would like to spend my remaining time as an academic uh, helping to conserve birds. But I've known that I can't do that by myself because it takes a team if you're to have any hope of making a measurable difference. So about the time I made this decision, President Michael McRobbie here at Indiana University decided to enable the knowledge resources here at Indiana University and IUPUI to come together and have the funds to be able to address complex, significant, societal problems and bring those solutions to the people of Indiana. And the first grand challenge, as they're called, was and is designed to cure cancer. And another grand challenge is addressing the opioid crisis here in Indiana. And the third one is the one I'm here to represent. And so that is being prepared for environmental change. And that preparation is whether we make it or whether we don't. So I think it's definitely about uncharted waters. And I'm here to ask your help. I think we can't tune out. And I don't think it's too late. But we need to start. And I don't mean next year. I mean we need to start right now. So. We know that we're facing uh, un uh, unprecedented weather. We know we're facing asthma from elongated uh, growing seasons. Uh, the rate of uh, Lyme disease from ticks has increased 430% here in Indiana in the last five years. Six billion dollars in agricultural losses to extreme weather in the last five years. So there's a problem, but you know, it's hard for us to get our mind around things like that. And part of that problem, I think, is we don't live that long. The problems unfold over a longer period of time than our snapshot view of them. And so the urgency can be difficult unless you believe in charts and graphs. So, 
my husband and I, because I have been around for a while, we're both bird lovers, and this bird, the American kestrel, is one that we used to play a game. We'd be driving from Bloomington to Indianapolis to the airport, and we'd say, how many do we think we'll see? And we might guess 10 or 12 of these beautiful birds. And when I drive to the airport now, I don't see any kestrels. And the sky is really pretty barren of chimney swifts and of nighthawks and of other birds that used to be abundant but are not so visible. And I know because my baseline was set when I was 20 years old, the age really of many of you here, I expect in the audience. But I've gotten a chance to live 50 more years so I can feel the difference. But if you're just starting, you may not have that visceral sense that the winters are a lot warmer than they used to be and the summers are a lot hotter than they used to be and the springs come a lot earlier than they used to. But it may be your normal. So envisioning the future is hard for human beings and one way to attempt to overcome that limitation is to look back. Because if we see how much has changed, say, in the last 10, 200 years, then we might be able to imagine at least the extent of the change that could take place in the next 200 years, or the next 50, before most of you will have retired. So it's, I think it's worth thinking about. So 100 years ago, they were celebrating the uh, founding of the state of Indiana a hundred years before that. So this poster dates from the first centennial. And what you see is no cars, right? No NCAA, no Indy 500. What you see is Conestoga wagons, and a lot has changed since then. In the last 200 years, we in Indiana cleared the forests, 70% of Indiana's forests are now gone. We drained the wetlands, so 5,300 square miles of wetland were drained. We extirpated the fauna, the bison, the elk, the cougars, the wolves, going out over time. Who expects to see a wolf when they go out, right? But they used to live here. And the population size changed dramatically from, say, a 1,000 Europeans to uh, three million, actually two and a half, a hundred years ago, to 6.6 .6 million now. And we paved a great deal of the land and built cities, and we had a sense of abundance. So it isn't really we that I'm talking about, but it's the people who live on this land for the preceding 200 years that give us a chance to think how much has changed and hence the kind of change that we need to be prepared for. And so being prepared for change is what the grand challenge that I represent is about. And here's the team that I joined. So you may recognize uh, President McRobbie and Vice President uh, Fred Kate, and then collaborators that I have the great pleasure of working with, really smart people who have very diverse kinds of knowledge and expertise, but care about being prepared for environmental change. So they come from IU Bloomington and IUPUI, and they're biologists and geographers and atmospheric scientists, all natural scientists. They're from the School of Public Health, the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, and the law school. So they understand about social science. And they come from the media school and art architecture and design, because those people, my people now, uh, understand about communication and the importance of understanding. Even the university, even all broad expertise, even a lot of money can't solve a problem if we don't have partners outside the university. So here are just a few corporations, businesses, non-governmental organizations, a children's museum here in Bloomington, a land trust that I admire greatly. All of these people have agreed to participate in coming up with solutions to make Indiana and all of us in this room as prepared for environmental change 
as we can be. So how are we gonna do this? It's called systems thinking. That's not all that it'll take, but it does take thinking that everything is connected to everything else. I was trained as an ecologist. You might be trained as a neuroscientist who knows about nervous systems or training to be a doctor who knows about physiological systems. But the point about systems, even delivery systems and business systems, is that everything is connected to everything else. And you can't change just one thing. And there are interactions and feedbacks and nonlinearities. And if you're to avoid unanticipated, undesirable consequences, you need to bring together that expertise, you need partners, and you need to think through uh, what kinds of solutions can work. So we set some specific achievable goals. The natural scientists among us will be making accurate forecasts about the weather and changes in ranges of, say, ticks that carry Lyme disease. And we'll be working on making our cities greener, the urban green infrastructure that will make our cities more livable. livable. Uh, also, agriculture and the rural world. So if we're to come together as a state, we need to have a rural urban unification to solve problems. So we'll be doing research because this is a university and that's one of the things we do here. And some of this research will be on earth systems. And we've all had our minds alerted to the severity of the hurricanes that hit our coasts. And the severity of those is a reflection of the change in the atmosphere. But the impact is a reflection of the ways in which we've built our cities and drained those wetlands and made it so that when the torrential rains come, they flood rather than run back into the Gulf. We'll be doing research on movement ecology. So this beautiful piping plover happens to be carrying a GPS tag and by monitoring birds and their movements, we'll know more about the diseases that they carry. They aren't all bounty, but also how we might run our wind farms so that they're less damaging to bird populations because we'll know at what hours they fly and over what locations they're most abundant. We will be doing research on agriculture, on soil, on, soil, on water, on uh, fertilizer, and pesticide use and how to optimize the use of the land so that there's room for the organisms that provide ecological services like pollination or seed dispersal and that there'll be uh, conservation met methods that make modifications more appealing to the people who work the land. And then urban green infrastructure. So green roofs are already coming. Uh, I think probably New York City is a little bit ahead of us on this, but Indianapolis is gonna be one of our work sites and other cities here in Indiana, including Bloomington. And we're, uh, it's not just about beautification, it's also about pulling CO2 out of the air, it's about controlling uh, water flow after storms, it's about disaster preparedness. We can make our cities more livable. And then communication. So I'm a charts and graphs person, but uh, not everybody is. And so you may be a person who's persuaded by images or persuaded by stories or persuaded by the media, or maybe by a TED talk. That would be great. Uh, but this image is of a bird, once again, because I love birds. And the bird is, um, it's a horned lark. And horned larks look like the birds on your right, they have white bellies and bright yellow throats. But the birds on the left are also horned larks. They happen to be in the museum, these are skins from a museum, that were collected 100 years ago in Rust Belt cities. So there's a couple of messages here, I think. The particulates, the soot, is on the feathers. It's not like coming out of the bird's body. And so that was what the atmosphere was like a hundred years ago in Rust Belt cities. And now the birds have clean breasts. So I think that this gives us hope that if we uh, demand clean air and clean water, 
we can visibly see that we can be living in a healthier world for us and for our families. So, I'm gonna pull a little text out of my belly here. <laughs> I'd like to read something. This is put together by my friend Beth Gaisley, who's a member of the team. And the intention is to show you some images that are about how Indiana can be in the future if we work together to be prepared for environmental change. So, how can the world be different? Please imagine an Indiana farm couple. They're scanning the horizon from their porch. The city skyline, just to the east, has drawn closer than it was 25 years ago. There's more city and fewer farmers. But it's an engaging horizon, thanks to the new green roofs and linear parks planted with native grasses and trees to reduce runoff and keep down the heat. Looking at their own fields, the couple sees improvements nearer at hand. More precise dynamic modeling makes it easier for them to plan crop rotations. Better habitat for pollinators makes it easier for them to enhance the crop's productivity. And today their planning involves not just market economics, but also knowledge, knowledge of weather patterns and insects and diseases. Last month, the couple sent their firstborn off to college in that city they see. And she was home just last week with a head full of ideas about carbon sinks and carbon capture. Apparently, there's good money in green collar jobs, or so she tells them. A burst of laughter captures their attention. Over the horizon, ambles, a youth group, they're headed to the river here, the river abutting the property, and on the way they cross a strip of land that the couple plans to donate to a land trust. New policies guarantee them a pretty nice tax break. The undeveloped land will offer a healthier migratory pathway for birds, and some of those birds are raptors who keep mice out of the fields. Fewer mice, fewer ticks less Lyme disease. The kids at the river's edge are extracting equipment from their packs. They're citizen scientists. They're here to assess the species diversity on this strip of land. They heard about it from some interns that came from the sustainability project here at Indiana and were uh, motivated to get out and learn about water themselves. So it's time to leave. The couples have to go to a community, meet, community meeting. Who would have thought that farmers, residents, government managers, environmental advocates, and scientists would be sitting in a planning room together? But it's been achieved, and it's been achieved through a stronger relationship between science and policy a stronger relationship between people and the land, and a stronger relationship between Indiana University and the citizens of Indiana. So we are about to enter uncharted waters, but we can be prepared, and I hope that you'll all want to participate and maybe think a little bit about birds too. So thank you for the honor of talking with you. There is a rhythm to our natural world. The timing. Everything in harmony with the orchestra of life. But the beat is changing. Familiar patterns are disappearing. Ecosystems are altering in the farthest corners of our planet and right here in the Hoosier State. It means new challenges. Affecting every single one of us, no matter our faith, our profession, or our politics. Some of the challenges are obvious. Others are more difficult to see. 
but they're all changing our very way of life, changing how we eat, our infrastructure, our energy use, even how we breathe. So we don't just have to be prepared to react. We have to be prepared to lead. Prepared for Environmental Change is a new initiative sponsored by the Grand Challenges Program at Indiana University. It's a group of hundreds of scientists, professors, students, environmentalists, ecologists, business people, public officials, and concerned citizens from all walks of life throughout Indiana. People working together to meet the challenges of our changing world with predictive modeling, early warning systems, and collaborative pilot projects, and new ideas to plan and build green infrastructure, conserve biodiversity, clean and protect our waterways, and harness the mighty forces of nature. Becoming a model for other communities facing the same challenges around the world. Because environmental change is one of the biggest tests of our time. It's one of our greatest challenges. And now, right now, it's time to get to work. We can help when we take the lead. For our friends and neighbors, our families, for our cities and towns, for all the people around the world, for this singular place we call home. Indiana University's Grand Challenges, prepared for environmental change.